This week on the agenda, we're at the World Economic Forum Growth Summit in Geneva to talk to WEF Managing Director Sadia Zahidi. Hello from Geneva and the World Economic Forum Growth Summit 2023. It's taking place against a difficult economic background and WEF's latest report highlights the uncertainties. Global growth is sluggish and chief economists remain split over the likelihood of a global recession. I spoke to WEF Managing Director Sadia Zahidi about that outlook. Sadia Zahidi, a pleasure to see you and so much to talk about. Uh, but let's talk about how experts are split on whether we're headed for global recession. What, what's your outlook? So we launched for the Chief Economist Outlook yesterday and 45% of the Chief Economists we surveyed said there will be a global recession this year. And 45% exactly said, no, there will not be a global recession this year. And at the very same time, they're also telling us that the overall picture around growth on average around the world is starting to look a little better than it did the last time we produced the outlook in January of 2023. So I think in one word, the big issue right now is uncertainty and with very different data coming out at almost every single day in terms of the health of the financial system, in terms of interest rate rises, in terms of what is happening in terms of debt in many emerging markets. Um, all of that together is creating a lot of uncertainty. Now, where we see things going is it really depends on the decisions taken by policymakers. I think none of this is set in stone. These are not predictions. These are you know, potentially forecast using the situation of today. So it's really all going to depend on the decisions taken by policymakers. And I mean both short term decisions, so decisions taken by central banks, and also longer term decisions. Um, there's a lot of activity happening in terms of industrial policy in both uh, developed and developing markets, but that's going to change the picture around growth and potential recessions for years to come. Now, we've talked before uh, about resilient growth and what it's going to take. Yeah innovation, policy, investment um, and finance. So are those steps being taken? I think those steps are being taken if we look at, you know, I mentioned industrial policy. It is back in vogue in a way that we probably haven't seen since the 1970s um, and especially in a number of uh, Western economies, especially in the United States, especially in Europe. Now, the view of our chief economists um, in the outlook we just launched is that the picture is mixed. On the one hand, they see that you know this is going to be part of the strategy of economic policymakers for years to come in developing and developed economies alike. And on the other hand, they're concerned that it may not deliver on the actual innovation that we're looking for. They're also concerned that it will create more geopolitical rifts. They're also concerned that it's picking winners and losers rather than letting competitiveness play out and competition play out. So there are some concerns around it, but I think the big picture, the governments um, have received the message that to come out of this crisis, we do have to grow our way out of the crisis, that growth is still very important for improving living standards, that we do need to collaborate on climate change in between governments, but we also need to be putting in place the right kinds of investments. So that bigger picture message is very much there, but I think we have to make sure that it doesn't come at the price of competition and innovation. I wonder too what all of this means for jobs. Uh, you, your, the forum's latest jobs report says up to a quarter of jobs will change and that's just in the next five years. 14 million will disappear. What's that going to mean for the global workforce? So I want to qualify that number um, against the entire population of jobs that we were looking at. 673 million jobs in total that are covered by this report. Um, a 23% churn as we describe it and that churn reflects um, about 12% decline and just over 10% growth. So on average, actually, we're looking at a pretty balanced picture of growth and decline of jobs. Now, of course, you know, the exact precise number around the 14 mil million is very worrying. But if I qualify that against the full set of predictions and this entire set of jobs we're looking at, um, I think that's a relatively balanced forecast. Now, to get into the details of why, we look at 
shifts in supply chains globally that is likely to create a lot of jobs locally in many different parts of the world. A second element is the green transition, which is net positive. So overall supposed to create uh, a, be a net job creator. Um, economic growth as a whole, because it's looking so tepid, is likely to be a net job destroyer if things continue as they are and if growth remains as low as it is. And then finally, when it comes to technology, the picture is very mixed. About 50% of companies believe that technology will be a net job creator, and just over 25% of companies believe that technology will be a net job destroyer, and the other um, quarter are undecided. So we're looking at very different factors that are affecting jobs, and on average, that's leading to that 23% structural churn. So where is the real jobs growth going to come from? Is it food? Is it tourism? Is it technology? You tell me. It's a very good question, and I think we have to look at it in two different ways. One is relative to today's jobs, where is the highest growth supposed to come from? And so relative to today's picture, the highest growth is going to be in technology-related jobs. It's going to be uh, among those that are artificial intelligence specialists, big data specialists, people who um, are, have spe expertise in machine learning, people who are uh, sustainability specialists. So the green aspect is supposed to also lead to growth. Um, environmental protection specialists, um, people who are doing all kinds of analysis around business, that's all going to grow. Um, but then when it comes to the absolute growth, so the largest amount of num numbers of jobs being created, that is agriculture, that's education, that is largely speaking green jobs, but they're cutting across a number of different sectors. Um, and in almost all of those cases, those are jobs that are enabled by technology. So the integration of technology into agriculture is going to lead to job growth um, on nearly 4 million jobs being created because of that. The integration of technology into education is going to lead to growth, especially in higher education and vocational education, about 3 million jobs being created there. So the relative change, it could end up looking like it's all about just typical technology jobs for very, very specialized expertise. But when you look at the absolute gain, actually it's in sectors that are incredibly important for society, agriculture and food production, education, to some extent health, although there, there's a different issue. There's a high demand for jobs, yeah. but very little talent that wants to go in there. Talent, that's a key thing. And you've talked a lot about specialized expertise. So let's talk about human capital and the scale of the investment that's going to be needed. The scale is going to be massive. I think we've talked about you know, the technology revolution and the digital revolution. We've talked about the, um, the, the green revolution that is needed. But without a skills revolution, none of the rest comes true. And we don't get back to growth in any way. We don't get to higher living standards. And I think that's a very sobering message coming out of the report, more so even than the specific types of jobs that are growing and declining. 44% um, of the average skills core skills in the average job are going to need to be replaced and changed in the next four years alone. So people like you and me, nearly half of what we do on a daily basis, the core skills around that have to start changing because of everything else that we're going to have to work with because of all of the other um, shifts that will, that will affect all of our jobs. So that's not a job that is fully declining, that is not a job that is fully growing, but just the average job. So we do need a skills revolution, and that's where a lot of governments are under-investing and not realizing how big of a change it is that they need to make. You talk about a skills revolution. Um, I'm wondering, though, about equity within that. Yeah. Gender equality, women, um, and the aging population. These are big themes at this growth summit. Yeah. So two things there. I think the good news is that we have heard from the companies that were surveyed, and we surveyed um, nearly 800 firms um, for the Future of Jobs report, that about 80% of them are planning to focus on the integration of women as a source of new talent. Um, about 60% are planning to focus on youth as a source of new talent. And nearly 50% of those companies are planning to focus on people with disabilities who now they can integrate much more because of technology into the workforce as well. So companies recognize that they need talent and that they need to not have biases when they're thinking about bringing in talent. 
A second element that is also positive news is that many companies are planning to use what's called a skills first approach. So instead of looking for those that have a certain type of degree, instead of looking for those that have a certain type of employer in their past work experience, they're planning to look at who has got the right actual skills and they're planning to test for those skills themselves. They're planning to promote people on the basis of those skills, retain people on the basis of those skills. So all of that is very good news. But then when it comes to thinking about equality in the midst of the many crises and the many shifts and transformations that organizations are facing, there I think the picture is a little bit more mixed. So the biggest losses in jobs are going to be happening to bank tellers, um, administrative assistants, secretarial work, people that are postal service clerks. These are all jobs that have actually produced very good middle-class livelihoods for women, primarily, in many parts of the world. And that's where the biggest losses are coming from. So I think we're not prepared for what's about to happen there and the additional gender gap that that will end up creating. A second part of the not so good news um, is that when it comes to the growing professions, those almost always, in the growing professions relative to today, they tend to be the ones that are not currently having a very strong pipeline of women going into them. So whether that's the machine learning specialists or the AI specialists or those that are working on big data analysis, those tend not to be the largest employers of women. And so this is something that's going to have to get balanced out over time. Otherwise, the people working on the most interesting, exciting, high paid jobs are not going to be women. So these are the issues, talking to experts, talking to leaders, non-government organizations, academia, industry experts. What's the feeling you're getting? So I think there's been, over the last two days, uh, you know, a lot of yesterday has been spent on context setting, on really trying to understand yeah. where are we in terms of the global economy, where are we in terms of jobs, where are we in terms of skills. A lot of today has been about finding solutions to those issues. And there's been um, a, a group that has for long been coming together focused on the reskilling revolution. Um, they announced a few months ago in Davos that they've reached 350 million people. Today there's been a great new announcement which is focused on K through 12 education. And it's the launch of Teach AI where we're partnering with Code.org and others, a number of technology companies, a number of education companies, a number of um, uh, unions and others to try to see how do we actually teach children faster than AI is invading their lives. And that is something that actually can be done so that children know how to work, for example, with artificial intelligence and work with technology. So those are the kinds of, you know, these are two examples, but those are the kinds of initiatives that have been taken forward here. Still to come on the agenda, more from Sadia Zahidi on the real cost of climate change. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent, find new opportunities, discover a path forward. CGTN, see the difference. We can try out the wild and crazy ideas. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we're trying to save the world. Awesome. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more. Just gotta be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. 
the world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTF. What do we mean when we talk about the difference? Brazen axe. The difference is in the detail. In the background. Defense ministers from the wider angle and perspective of every story. Wherever the story may be. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to The Agenda in Geneva at the World Economic Forum Growth Summit 2023. Let's hear more now from my interview with WEF Managing Director Sadia Zahidi. Sadia, in terms of the geography of, of growth, how's that changing and who, where, is racing to the front? So we asked the um, ex chief executives and the heads of HR that were uh, uh, surveyed for the Future of Jobs report the biggest trends that were impacting them and where they expected to shift some of their investment. It's very clear that Asia will be the winner. So certainly China, but also a number of other countries in Asia, whether that's Bangladesh or Vietnam um, and other organizations, uh, sorry, other uh, countries that are trying to be an attractive space for investment. But I think there's also a cautionary message here. No country can hope to compete in this new global economy and to be able to do much more of the sort of localization of production and growth that they're hoping to do without skills, without human capital. That message again comes across. And so if countries previously had been competing on the basis of very cheap labor, they will not be able to continue to do so. They will have to invest in human capital, invest in skills and work towards better quality work for their workforce. You mentioned Asia, so I wonder how important is China to robust economic recovery, taking into consideration all those things you've said? It's one of the few bright spots, according to our chief economist outlook. So um, certainly the outlook in terms of growth is better than many other parts of the world. And then when it comes to inflation, it's the only region where there isn't a concern for inflation at present. Now, of course, China's reopening could contribute to global inflation, the consumption, the demand from there. But there, again, there's still a mixed picture and we don't yet see evidence of that happening. So many of these conversations about growth come back to, to the same thing, the need for a greener economy, to, to think more sustainably. What are the immediate challenges of climate vulnerability in this context? So I think that's where it's very clear that countries have to meet their commitments to the Paris goals. Um, I think we have to keep 1.5 alive. There is an energy transition that needs to take place. But what's been very interesting here at the Growth Summit is how far advanced real action is. We've had a number of technology pioneers, a number of unicorns that are actually providing some of the technologies that can help all of us transition to greener growth and greener energy. They're present here. A second element has been we did a partnership with LinkedIn and it's very clear that green skills are in incredibly high demand, but we're not preparing people fast enough. And so because it's very horizontal, it's everything from somebody who's you know, a solar energy engineer all the way through to somebody who's working on recycling and the circular economy. These are very different set of skills and they need to be developed by sector. So that's another element that's actually being done now and people are focused and specialized on that. So, so is there a pipeline problem? There is a pipeline problem, but there's a pipeline problem that cannot be done, dealt with in a centralized horizontal way. It is something that actually needs to be dealt with sector by sector because largely speaking, green skills are very specialized by sector and that's something that needs to, that needs to change. 
maybe a third element, there's sort of this, this trilemma. Can we bring together growth, jobs, and sustainability at the same time? And we had a session here this morning where I think the resounding answer was, yes, it can be done. Of course, it is with certain caveats. Governments have to think differently about this. Human capital is still central to that for the growth element, for the green element, and for the jobs element. But it can be done. And according to our Future of Jobs report, greener growth is supposed to lead to a lot of net job creation, even in the sectors which are going to be declining. So um, brown energy sectors, for example, a lot of people that are in carbon intensive industries have the skill sets that can be transferred over to greener energy sectors. And so there's expected to be a shift of people from, for example, oil towards greener energy. And in general, that seems to be a manageable shift from what we heard here. A manageable shift. It, within what time frame did you discuss that? Now, of course, that depends on how quickly that overall energy transition is taking place. but there are adjacent skills. I think theoretically the answer is that somebody who is working in oil should be able to shift over to, for example, solar energy. How fast that happens is going to depend in, on the one hand on some of those companies themselves. As they become green growth companies, how are they going to make sure that they reskill and upskill their workforce? But frankly, that is like any other organization. How are they going to reskill and upskill their workers? You mentioned solar and that's got me thinking, is the future of growth all about where renewable energy comes from? And, and if so, who holds the cards? So I think this is going to be a very interesting shift, but even longer term than what we've been discussing here. If the production of energy is going to become much more localized, actually there's a massive opportunity there for emerging markets, there's a massive opportunity there for developing economies, but they're going to have to think very differently. This is no longer going to be, or it shouldn't be, about traditional methods of thinking about natural resources and selling those natural resources and then leading to very little growth and returns and opportunity for your local population. If countries that hold the cards on green minerals, but also on solar energy and other forms of energy, um, if they plan this well, this can be a massive development boom for their economies. But they have to plan it well and they have to learn the lessons from the past. The countries that use natural resources well are among the biggest players in the world today. And the countries that did not use natural resources well and only relied on that natural resource instead of thinking about diversification, instead of thinking about inclusion for their populations, they're not performing so well. You're talking about the haves and the have-nots. and. That leads me on to the, the divide, because we, we've often talked about the, the inequity um, of, of growth and, and how things are happening at a different pace yep. um, in different places, um, different parts of the world, often to the detriment of certain vulnerable groups. So what, who risks being forgotten? I think there are two elements to that, and that's been among the sobering messages here at the Growth Summit. One. Perhaps advanced economies can afford to have slowing growth because living standards are already very high. But in the midst of this constant set of crises that we've been facing over the last three years, it's very clear that some of the developing economies, in particular those that do not have large internal markets and that have to rely on global trade, that have to rely on globalization of products and services and ideas and human capital, they're the ones that have been suffering the most over the last three years. And we must ensure that the integration of the global economy continues if we want those smaller economies that are open to the world to continue to have opportunities. Now, there are specific niches. They can still compete on the basis of um, skilled labor, skilled online labor. But a lot more needs to be done to ensure that there is a trade recovery as well. That's one element. The second element is within countries there continues to be growing inequality and that is in part because of the effects of technology that's in part because of um, you know the affordability of shifting towards greener consumption shifting towards sustainable consumption for some parts of the population but not for other parts of the population energy access continues to be a massive problem there's still three billion people that are not connected online and that's not country by country that's also within countries and so the inequality issue within countries and the inequality between countries, that has been key to the conversations here. But I think a big faith in skills and human capital investment, education investment for the next generation, big faith in integration of 
parts of the population that are otherwise disadvantaged and big faith in using green, green, green as a way to grow out of this situation. I know you want this summit to, to come together with short term collaboration, longer term cooperation, maybe to create a framework for growth that hardwires things like equity and sustainability and, and resilience into economic policy. What positive signs are you seeing? So our Future of Growth Framework will hopefully be coming out in October of this year. Um, and by the time we come together in January in Davos, um, we, we hope to really be able to take forward the work of the consortium that was launched in, in Davos this year. Now, all of that said, I think every single person here at the summit, and there were 400 leaders, all the way from economists to CEOs to government leaders, every single person here said, we need the Future of Growth to be inclusive, to be resilient, to be sustainable. But there are divides about how to do that. There are areas where there's very clear synergies. Um, yes, for many parts of the world which have traditionally relied on, um, on, on fossil fuel energy, there can be a lot of hope if they're able to switch very quickly to solar energy, and that's where there is a win-win. But there's also areas where there's going to be trade-offs. There are going to be countries that will have um, a massive amount of green minerals available to them but in order to extract those minerals, they have to be doing some destruction of their natural environment. And so there are some very clear trade-offs, and I think we can't be blind to those trade-offs. The same can be said when it comes to inclusion. You can grow very fast, but you can also choose to slow growth because you're choosing to invest in the social infrastructure that is needed, whether that is childcare, whether that's healthcare, whether that's more investment in education. And these are in many parts of the world things that are provided by governments that are socially provided rather than having commercial solutions. So I think we have to be conscious of the trade-offs that have to be made. And I think we're not yet at the end of the summit, but if I can start summarizing some of what I've heard, people are willing to slow down growth in order to get it right when it comes to resilience, social inclusion, and being able to grow more sustainably. And that is okay because growth in itself is not the end goal. It's to be able to do it in a way that's going to make people happier, that's going to improve well-being, that's going to improve living standards, and at the same time protect the planet. So it's, it's not just about places, it's also about sectors. You mentioned education, you mentioned healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, there are big concerns right now in banking and, mm -hmm. and in the broader financial sphere can we expect more of the same? And if so, what should we be looking out for? Yeah. So I'm going to rely on the views of our chief economist who said, yes, this has shaken some foundations, but they do not right now see signs of ongoing wider financial system instability. I think that's actually a relatively positive viewpoint. Now the news continues to unfold and we know that there's more announcements expected today and more announcements expected tomorrow um, from, from various central banks. And that's going to continue to reveal some vulnerabilities. At the same time, the chief economists also say that they do expect potentially more concerns in the banking sector later this year, but not to the extent of a systemic financial crisis, not to the extent of the financial crisis of 2008. And that still remains a very positive viewpoint and, and I think an important piece of um, starting to build more certainty into the global outlook. And yet there are other sectors that might be having wobbles. Is property a concern? Um, we were not able to get enough useful information, I think, from the Chief Economist's outlook that I would be able to comment on that. But of course, I think um, in many parts of, for example, the United States, um, the health of the banking sector is very tied to the health of the property sector. What is happening in terms of interest rates is very tied to the health of the property sector. So I think clearly that's something that it must be watched, but I couldn't point to any data at the moment from our work. Sadia Sahidi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Great to be with you. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming soon on The Agenda, Turkey decides We'll examine what's really at stake in the upcoming elections. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all of the Agenda team here in Geneva, goodbye.